Okay, so yes, using the Atlas of Living Australia. We're, we're fantastically fortunate to have the Atlas of Living Australia, and I hope lots of you are already using it. It includes information from, uh, I think, there are more than 60 million occurrences of various species across the country. And I, I, I wasn't involved with creating it, but it, it's, we should really thank the people who did. It's a world-class system. It's been adopted by the Global Biodiversity Information Facility and uh, systems in France and Spain have recently been established using some of the code from the, uh, from the ALA. So we're, we're very fortunate to have it. Okay, just before I start about using the Atlas in, in detail, uh, I'd like to uh, just give you a bit of back, uh, some background issues. And Linda's already spoken about uh, the need to consider the use particularly of high quality and genetically diverse seed, and uh, maybe not to get too obsessed with the, the use of local seed. And Linda's also spoken about uh, provenance and local adaptation, and we have varying information about local adaptation. But on the broad scale, we can see from things like commercial forestry that um, provenances from cooler locations tend to be adapted to those cool conditions, whereas provenances from warm locations, not surprisingly, adapted to, uh, are better adapted to those warmer conditions. So this led to the uh, Suzanne Prober and others suggesting the idea of what they call climate-adjusted provenancing, which the idea is to use local seed, by all means continue to do that, but con consider including some seed from areas that may be similar to the projected future climatic conditions. And in order to show you how to do that, we'll look at the Climate Change in Australia website, and there again we're very fortunate to have world-leading scientists developing excellent methods for making projections about what the likely conditions are going to be and what the variability about those conditions is likely to be. So we'll have a look at that. Uh, but we'll look mainly at using the Atlas of Living Australia. And um, it's appropriate, given Jill's introductory talk, that I'll be using an example site near Albury and White Box as an example species. And I'm a big fan of the revegetation guides and the work of Fleur Stelling, uh, Stelling and the uh, colleagues. And... Um, they're very complementary to these computer methods. So it's great seeing those distributions and uh, also having access to the computers. I should also say that this method is going to, well, is in, explained in a paper which will be appearing in ecological management and restoration soon. Um, okay, so there are five key steps that we want to look at. The first is to identify potential local seed sources. Then we want to know what the current climatic conditions are at our target site. Then we want to know what the projected, what's the likely future conditions climatically at that site. And then to identify small regions that match those future climates so that we can identify particular areas from which we might collect seed. I should explain that the paper by Suzanne Prober and others proposed this as a theoretical idea and provided lots of references supporting it as a good idea, but didn't uh, explain how you would identify actual places on a map that you might want to collect seed for. So that's what we'll look at here. And finally, there's another useful facility within the Atlas of Living Australia to identify existing projects and it may be that existing projects have already collected some seed that you want to use. Okay, so the first step is to identify potential local seed sources. And there's a really neat feature in the Atlas of Living Australia called Explore Your Area. You simply put in the latitude and longitude of your site, and it brings up information on species that have been found in that site Someone mentioned five kilometres, and the default in that, this system is a five-kilometre radius around your target site. And as I mentioned, my example site is just north of Albury. When you first fire that up, it will indicate that 7,000 different species, different plants and animals, have been recorded in that area. 
but you can then go to the particular target species that you might be interested in. You can see half, about halfway down the column of species, this white box, and the eight points on there indicate the locations within your target area from which white box has been recorded. And another neat feature is you can click on any of those eight points and it will bring up detailed information about that site. When was the observation made? How reliable is the observation? What are the climatic conditions? What are the soil conditions at, at that site? Is it a, a, a dubious outlier in the whole data set? So if you only use the ALA for that, uh, it's worth considering using it. So the next thing is to estimate the current climatic conditions for the site. So we can bring in layers, interpolated surfaces for mean annual temperature and mean annual precipitation, and we can move a pointer to the site that we're interested in. Uh, down here, it will show you what the mean annual temperature and mean annual precipitation conditions are for that particular location. And in this case, as it says there, 14 and a half degrees mean annual temperature and 730 millimeters of rainfall. That was again in the Atlas of Living Australia. Now we go to the uh, Climate Change in Australia website to look at what are the projected future conditions. It looks a bit complicated at first, but it's fairly straightforward when you get used to it. We're looking at a, a particular table from, there's a Murray Basin cluster report, and the columns are annual surface temperatures and saying, is it going to be slightly warmer or is it going to be much hotter? So four, four different classes. And then it's uh, looking at rainfall. Is it going to be much wetter or much drier? So within each of those four by four uh, matrices, you come to the more detailed thing, so you can look at, are you interested in a projection for the year 2030, for 2050, or for 2090? And you can also make assumptions about whether you believe greenhouse gas emissions will be low, medium, or high. So the ones that I've starred, I've uh, selected two from 2030 and one from 2090, and the numbers within these boxes indicate the greater the number, that's the more models have produced that outcome. So the greater the number, the more likely is that outcome. So I've picked a couple of likely outcomes for 2030 and one example outcome for 2090. Okay, so you can then go back into the Atlas of Living Australia and there's a thing uh, which enables you to map environmental envelopes in the area description part of the, of the atlas, and the black shaded areas uh, represent the warmer conditions. This, so this is the first scenario. You remember that uh, we estimated a mean annual temperature under current conditions for our site of 14 and a half degrees. So we're looking at a, an increase in temperature by 2030 of a half a degree, or one and a half degrees, and similar mean annual precipitation. So it's saying 5% more or 5% less. It's, in this particular case, it's uncertain. The arrow points to the target location that we're looking at. There are some black shaded areas close to our target location. There may be some gene flow already between our target site and that area. So if we were looking to introduce material that's better adapted to these conditions, but from a little distance away, we might want to go to this area here. This is the Hume Highway, and here's Canberra, and here's Wagga. So some dark shaded areas under this scenario are on the, the Canberra sort of side of the, of the Hume Highway. So that, that's under similar mean annual precipitation conditions. We can then look at what the suitable areas are under slightly drier conditions. So here we're looking at, at minus 15 to minus 5 in precipitation. So the same temperature change, but somewhat drier conditions. Again, the red arrow indicates the target site is here, and we've shifted to the drier side of the Hume Highway. So the next thing we can do is to zoom in to identify possible locations where we might want to collect seed. These are all maps produced within the Atlas of Living Australia. And here on this map, I've dropped out the background map that shows locations. 
But what I've brought in, the red dots, are the, the distribution of, whi of white box of eucalyptus albums. So you've got 6,000 locations across Australia where that's been recorded. And what we can do is to zoom in to those areas. The, the black shaded area is the area that we've identified as being similar to the 2030 projection. And we can zoom into that at the highest resolution. The Atlas of Living Australia shows you the Google Earth map. Uh, so that's very neat because you can see the example locations. The red dots are our example locations, which are places where we know there's white box and we know it's within those future conditions. And we can see there that it's conveniently those dots are within a large contiguous area. So if it was pointing to an isolated tree in the middle of a paddock, you probably wouldn't want to uh, sample from that. But that gives you some confidence that you may be sampling a, a genetically diverse stand. OK, we can also look at how conditions might turn out in 2090. And you can see the dark shaded areas now move a, a lot further north. The, the nearest of those is about 300 kilometers away. And when you look that far ahead, you may start to wonder you know, how well will seed from there handle current conditions at our, at our target site. So you may, you may not want to go that far. The next thing that you can do in the atlas is to identify existing projects that may have already collected uh, seed of the sort that you're interested in. So here, again, is uh, we're looking at Albury there. And uh, here I've pulled up information on a trial being established by Holbrook Landcare folk. So this project explorer within the Atlas, I mean, I, I guess the people in Albury are very familiar with the people in Holbrook, but if you go further away, um, there may well be trials that you're not familiar with, and uh, it's just interesting to see what's happening in your local area as well. One thing that I wanted to draw people's attention to is a very interesting uh, CSRO National Outlook report that was published in 2015. This is looking at a whole range of issues, agricultural, industrial, commercial, for Australia over the period to 2050. And one of the recommendations tucked away in their, one of their technical reports on page 72, if you want to check it out, is a recommendation for the establishment of 15 million hectares of a, a restoration type plantings by 2050 for carbon sequestration. Very useful thing to quote if you're uh, preparing a proposal, I'd suggest. 15 million hectares is a pretty significant area. You're looking at you know, more than seven times the area of commercial plantations in the country. So it's, it's a big area. So if we were going to do that for carbon sequestration purposes, we'd want to be pretty sure that there's a good chance that they're going to survive. And I think here in New South Wales, for carbon sequestration, you have to, you undertake that your plantings will be maintained for 100 years. So you may like to consider using climate-adjusted provenancing. The advantage should be that it will increase the climatic resilience of your site. Limitations are certainly increased cost and complexity, but if there was collaboration between adjacent groups, those costs may well be reduced. We can't pretend that we have complete information uh, about how to do this, about just how far away you should move. Um, but if you're wanting to explore the method, and I would certainly encourage you to look at the Atlas of Living Australia if you haven't already done so. So the paper there were, describes these methods in detail. And I'll just leave you with two two thoughts. One is uh, a Shakespearean quotation indicating that we don't have, uh, sadly, unlike the witches in, in Macbeth, we don't have complete knowledge of what will happen in, in the future and which seeds will grow and which will not. But we believe that it's better to foresee even without certainty than not to foresee at all. Thank you.